Yeah. We'll start, so we're, we're going to start recording once you're ready to. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm so ready. All right. Yeah. Oh, are you unmuted on Zoom? Am I unmuted? <sighs> um. Let's see. Zoom, can you hear the speakers? There you go. Yep. Now we can. Okay. Ready? All right. It is. Thank you all for coming to Link Colloquium today. Um, woo! Yeah! Let's get excited! Yeah! Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Hugh Patterson the third, father of Hugh Patterson the fourth, the fifth. Whoa! We keep it odd. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hugh recently earned his MA in linguistics from the University of North Dakota um, and has been working in the field for quite a long time uh, before that um, and can, continues to do so. Um, Hugh's work integrates information science, library science, and linguistics, particularly field linguistics, um, and he's particularly interested in orthographies and um, how we actually input stuff on keyboards, and he's going to be talking about that today for the talk entitled Language Script, Orthography, and Text Input. Grading text input difficulty across languages. Thank you. Without further ado. Great. <clears throat> so yes, uh, today I hope to share with you some, some things that I've learned about language script, orthography, and text input. Um, my background, as Chris was saying, was in the field, and I first got involved with this in Mexico, but when I met Becky and started looking at African languages, it was very much, oh, they're the same issues over there. So um, I have worked uh, in Mexico and in Nigeria, and those experiences informed my need, right? And so today I'm going to talk a little bit, there's going to be a little bit of a topic map through our discussion today. and. Uh, my need then was related to this language work and language documentation was my approach and that perspective. Um, but obviously, I have a desire not just to document language, but to see these languages used in the ways that benefit their community by their community members. So I think that's broadly some of the same goals as language revitalization. Um, and then uh, to do the work on keyboards and text input and such, I have to look at things like orthography, language, script, the text input model, right? Uh, the layout. And then also um, then to like really look at things across languages, we have to set up some sort of experiment design. Um, and in the world of text input, um, this is a search space problem. So in information science, we talk about uh, search optimization and finding things efficiently, effectively, um, finding the right things. Um, and so a keyboard layout in, in this uh, kind of approach is a solution to a problem. And uh, so finding those solutions is uh, a challenge going across when you consider different orthography scripts and its approach to in information science in different ways. It includes differences in finger models, and then I'll talk a little bit about parallel corporate and how they've helped me and what I uh, can do. So at the center of what we talk, we're going to talk about is keyboard layouts, and I'm talking about the keyboard layout that is looking like this, right? So text input happens a lot of different ways, and this is what I'm talking about, okay? Um, and so I'm going to couch this, following that topic map, I'm going to couch this discussion a little bit uh, in the world of language uh, documentation and revitalization first. I'm going to like move out from there um, through the topic map. But uh, thinking about language and the economics of linguistic exchanges, uh, this is a, I read about this uh, a couple years ago now, but uh, um, Pierre Bourdieu uh, from, uh, was a great philosopher in, in, in anthropology and talks, uh, raised some ideas about social capital and, and these kinds of things. And 
And he had a, a very influential article for me then in Economics of Linguistic Exchanges. And one of the premier ideas that he presents is language as object versus language as instrument. So I think as maybe as scientists, we'd like to think about languages as object. We'd like to classify them. We'd like to do different kinds of things. Uh, we'd like to describe their attributes. And we kind of disembody language from the speaker populations that use those languages. Um, whereas language as instrument is often probably a more accurate, of the two is probably a more accurate uh, way that speaker communities might uh, describe their languages, what they want to do with their language, what they can do with their language. You know, can they talk to a doctor? Can they talk to a government official? Can they run a social media campaign with their language? Um, so that's uh, language towards a goal versus language being an object of, of description. So when it comes to language resources, which I think that uh, a keyboard layout is probably a good example of language resource, um, we kind of have undocumented and underdescribed languages. Uh, probably over here in this language of instrument, there, you know, people use language all the time. But um, in thinking about the the works of Himmelman, uh, who was very influential in the language documentation discussion. Uh, early 2000s, uh, mid 2010-ish, uh, um, uh, had several influential works. Talking, talked about the difference between language documentation and language description, right? And I would say that these are two different ways that um, we look at language as an object, right? So the difference between just having raw resources and the the idea of language description, uh, then being more analytical with uh, linguistic theories applied and such, right? So in language development, then, um, I, I use this term following uh, some works by uh, Joshua and company. I'll, I'll get to their resources in, in one minute here. Um, but I'll explain that term in two slides, basically. Um, so let me just ask the audience a question. Where do you think keyboards fit in this on this grid? Where do they most appropriately fit? Development. In development, you put in, anyone else want to counter that with a suggestion? Oh. Uh, that's when you type it up. That's when you type it up. So you need it in that one. Yeah. Anyone else? All of them. <laughs> and it's in the middle for a reason, it's like, it is. So I've, like I said, I found this, I've, I encountered this problem when it's in documentation, but I think communities have a need when they want to uh, push their language in a direction that serves their common interests. Um, so um, I'm going to make this slide bigger in a minute when you, so you can see it, but uh, uh, <clears throat> in language development, that term, let me explain that term a little bit. So in the 1960s, um, there was a, a movement, at, you know, the, it was the end of, the beginning of the end of the colonial powers, and there's lots of new national governments coming along, and there was this question of what do we do with languages of the country, because there's this European model of, you know, French is for France and German is for Germany, so therefore you must have Tanzanian for Tanzania, right? Or something like that, right? But it's not, it's not the case. We know that there's a lot more diversity out there than these kinds of things, but the question of the national language came up, and then the um, Charles Ferguson, in a volume that's at, uh, edited by uh, Joshua Fishman, introduces the idea of language development as part of community development, as part of national development, uh, language development. And so uh, this term uh, gets used throughout the literature um, and uh, essentially means taking intentional steps to bring a language to a place that it is serving a community in some capacity and in, in taking in the intentionality to move that language to those capacities. So um, kind of thinking about this uh, language, language revitalization to me is a term that kind of only brings it up to where it was in vital status before. But I think when we take a language that has never been written down or has never had a uh, computer support and give it computer support, we're taking it to a new place. So if we look at the complete competencies of a language community, let's take a multilingual community because many languages that we work with in field contexts are multilingual communities, at least 
where I've been. Um, and we say all the communicative competencies of the entire community. Well, some of them might be uh, you know, in a language of ethnic identity. Uh, and so maybe that language gets, goes down in prestige, or maybe that language goes down in, in common use, and then maybe it resurges a little bit, and then maybe we bring it up to a, a much higher thing. But then re language revitalization maybe it only takes us up to wherever we've been before. But we want to go places where we've never been before. And so uh, that's why I, I use that, that term language development, because we want to go to places we've never been before, and we want to be successful in new kinds of ways. Um, so uh, <clears throat> that's kind of the, the language theory, the community theory. Now let's talk a little bit about language script and uh, a useful model for like thinking about these kinds of things. Because when we talk about uh, a context of enabling computer interactions with language, we need to be able to know that we're talking about the same language and we need to know how those computers are going to behave for those sorts of things. So. Constable um, now works for Microsoft. Uh, he published a paper in, in 2012, or no, 2002, and uh, he presents this model. And this model is very useful, I find, for uh, talking about some ideas that we talk about all the time in linguistics that the terms are not always very clearly defined by their authors. So an individual language, a writing system, orthography, and a domain-specific data set. So, uh, these four concepts, uh, in addition to this concept for script, uh, are very important when we talk about text input. It's because we get into a very definitive kind of thing when we say, I want to enter a T and I want it to be in the language of German. Uh, the computer behaves a certain way when, when we do those things. So Thai script in the Thai language or the Thai script in the not Thai language, right? They're going to be in different, uh, you're going to have different behaviors for the text. Um, so, um, talking about those four things here, uh, so uh, then an individual language in Unicode and in uh, Best Common Practice 47, which is a tagging system that computers use to communicate about the language and script content of text. Um, it relies on ISO 639-3 and it pulls from uh, ISO 15-924 to produce uh, BCP47 tags. Um, these then are uh, understood to be uh, describing writing systems, and then on top of those writing systems you might have spelling conventions, which are at the orthography level, and you might produce some domain-specific data. So let's talk about this a little bit and give some, a little bit of examples so you can follow with where I'm, I'm going on this. All right, uh, so in English and German, both use Latin script, right? This is not Thai script, this is not Korean script. This is uh, very familiar to most of us, like you're reading here. Um, so, but they're different writing systems because they have different characters in them, okay? So a writing system that has additional characters is going to then, uh, so if we're doing orthography reform or writing system reform, we might add new characters, right? So uh, at the orthography level though, um, British English and American English have different spelling conventions, right? We call it the same language with different spelling conventions. Germany, prior to 1996, used a certain spelling convention, and uh, post-1996 it had a different spelling convention. German and Switzerland has always had a different spelling convention than either of those two, and guess what? It, I would argue, has a different writing, uh, writing system, not just an orthography, because they don't use this character. So its character repertoire is smaller, um, and uh, though you might read German from Germany documents, and, and that might be included in there. So there's a knowledge, but then if you're looking at specific writing system validation types of stuff, you would not expect to see that character in a Swiss German document. Um, now, finally, down here, uh, domain-specific data sets. So I deal with um, library catalog uh, for how books are cataloged in libraries and such, right? But there are also newspaper articles, and there are interlinear gloss texts, right? As linguists, we're very familiar with those. So they all have different um, purposes, and so you might need text input for your different purposes, right? So if you're doing a transcription of IPA, then... Uh, uh, you might have a need a special text input. All right. 
So text input, you know, comes in all different sizes and shapes. And like I said, I'm really talking about the one that's computerized. Um, and I want to make sure we're not talking about this one either. You know, split keyboard stuff, uh, it's hard to compute for me. But there are people that do do this, okay? Um, here's, when we're talking just about computer keyboard, this, the, the physical shape of it. Um, the uh, one that I deal with most is ANSI, and you'll see the red here is uh, highlighting some differences. Now, if you're from European context, uh, you probably use an ISO configuration, and if you're uh, in the Asian context, specifically Japan, you might use this one. Um, and what these are very interesting intellectually because they have different numbers of keys available, and you can create different patterns of alternative character input uh, with different uh, characters there. So um, we'll get into that in, in uh, a few minutes. I'll show you some character pattern inputs. Um, so I want to then just also take a moment here on the next slide to um, talk about uh, a reference to my abstract. I presume everybody read the abstract, but I just want to cover it so we have some common ground. And um, one of the essential questions that I've been asking is how do we understand if it's easier to type this language, this language, or this language, and can we quantify that? Right? So if we want to take, taking this perspective on language revitalization, and we want to uh, say, to what extent is technology a barrier to taking our language into a place that it's never been, we should be able to quantify that. And I haven't seen this talked about in the literature at all in a quantified way. Um, so these three languages are uh, English, French, and Eastern Dan. And uh, finding a parallel corpus that covers the m very small languages of the world as well as the major languages of the world is very difficult. So in my work, I've found that Bible portions are actually a good pivot point. So I use um, a book of the New Testament, the book of James, which is a, a written letter, and uh, these are uh, just like the first few sentences of that, first sentence or something of that book, um, just to illustrate for the slides. Um, so Eastern Dan is a language that's spoken in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, over a million speakers, um, and some live in Liberia and some in uh, Guyana. Um, so, um, so this is the, the, the question that I want to ask about quantification. Is it more difficult to type this bottom one, this middle one, or the top one? And Cote d'Ivoire, where the multilingual community has a choice between these two, because uh, French is a national language, language of education, uh, this is the indigenous uh, language of e uh, ethnic identity. So, um, look, pursuing that question then, um, uh, I want to talk now a little bit about tone orthographies, because uh, tone is, it, I should say pitch, uh, is a central part of words uh, in phrases in many uh, indigenous languages around the world and uh, in many, well, I should just say languages, right? Because uh, there are major languages that use pitch as well to distinguish lexical items. But uh, in orthographies that are in the Latin script, right, that kind of look like English in the same script uh, of that context, <clears throat> uh, how these are, how tone is represented in these orthographies is very diverse. Um, a tone orthography typology. So Roberts, uh, in 2011, published a fantastic article. And if you're ever looking at uh, these things, you should read this article, OK? Um, and he has this typology of domain, target, symbol, position, density, and depth, asking how are different, what are the different mechanisms for indicating tone? And uh, I want to talk about density and depth today in 
how that relates to the keyboard question. But uh, in this typology, density um, is his work is then based off of Stephen Bird's work, but he defines it as some orthographies represent tone exhaustively. That is to say, every tone bearing unit carries a symbol for tone. So tone is a di has a diacritic density of one. So just to be clear, diacritics are uh, these little things above the, the character, okay? So you have the base character, and then if you have some like accent mark or diuresis or something, that's a diacritic, okay? So um, we could say that this U-like character has a diacritic above it. Um, now, tone diacritic density is precisely quantifiable by calculating the number of tone diacritics in a natural text, 100 word sample, as a percentage of the number of tone bearing units. So, Stephen Bird did an experiment in 1998, published in 1999, and uh, Dasheng, I think, is the language from Cameroon, and he relates it to literacy in the way of asking the question of how many diacritics uh, in a short sentence is too many for somebody to effectively process the information on. But his work didn't necessarily look at all of this, he just looked at diacritic density. Now, he looked at it very computationally. So uh, his, his work is quite well done mathematically, but the question is, if you have a orthography that says, well, instead of, if we have four, layer, or four levels of pitch and we only indicate three, that's not 100%, you can never get to 100% diacritic density. So the, the density question, it starts to break down the, the math on it a little bit. Um, and so let's, let's take a look then. Uh, so this, what, if you do the exhaustive tone marking with 100% diacritic, it would kind of look like this, a nice sentence with tone marks, right? And if you take uh, and say zero tone marking, then you, it would look like English, right? But uh, maybe tone is still significant in that language, right? So, uh, Definitional? Yeah. Do the diacritics have to be like actual diacritics? Like you can use capitalization or anything? Uh, you know, Bird does not actually define that. Um, but uh, it's a great question for the math of this problem, right? Uh, so uh, this, you would have an extra keystroke, right? Is that what you're saying? You'd have a diff you have, if you have two keystrokes for this one, you'd have three for that one, is what you're saying. If I understand your right. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, is it the case that tones are always represented with like that critics? Oh, no, 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 no. So in the typology that, that Robert brings forward, there are some orthographies that use another character before or after. So I think um, some Khmer uh, romanizations uh, use like an H afterwards or something like this. Uh, or, so there are, there are other ways of, of doing it where it's non-diacritic indication of tone. Exactly. Chicano languages use superscript numbers because they have uh, register and, and tones. Yeah. Um, it's a good question, though, whether those superscript numbers are diacritics or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, so, yeah. So there's another question, though, that tone makes it more difficult, or even gets <laughs> more difficult. I mean, what about tone melodies or tone patterns? Uh, and so where... Um, Bird talked about um, uh, the particular vowel connection uh, and, and mapping that. If you have a tone pattern that's over the entire word, then you have a different sort of math that you need to do. Uh, this analytical approach argues, uh, so the tone pattern and tone melody uh, analytical approach uh, talks about measuring tone at the phrase or word boundaries, okay? Um, and so measuring it in the way that Bird did uh, presents a, follows a, a um, analysis of a structural approach to the character. Um, so what happens when you have a tone melody like this, 
Uh, so a nice sentence with tone marks, right? So what happens when you come across a language that has a pattern that has a rule that says you can't have two highs together, right? So if you have a pattern that says this, then maybe you phonetically raise the high, or maybe you phonetically lower the high. Uh, it happens in different languages in different ways, but this is where the depth question of the typology that Roberts brought forward uh, is a question of, okay, if I mark it this way, is that the way that I have orthographic consistency here, regardless of where it occurs in the sentence? Or do I make it look phonetic, regardless of where it occurs in the sentence, okay? So, um, so that, that's the basic uh, question on that. Um, and Bird's, uh, so Bird's method, in my opinion, is uh, not a great method because it's phonologically accurate, but rather because it's consistently countable. Uh, and nobody had proposed anything up to this point uh, for, for Bird's work, uh, Bird's style work. And so uh, um, Roberts recently published a, a, a series of, uh, well, he co-authored a book and did 10 experiments uh, across African languages with tone orthographies. And uh, very great work and uh, addresses some of Bird's uh, methods and Bird's methods were influential in Roberts' work as well. So. Um, we talked about the high pitches already, so I'm going to go forward. So, when it comes to writing, though, and reading, the question is, are we going to write this as in, we write the base character, then we write the diacritic, then we go to the next word, then we write the base character and the diacritic. And this is very, like, it breaks up the phonological pattern that we might have if we are thinking about literacy and writing. Uh, and very naturally in English, we often just put things together. We have two characters together, uh, or three characters in like school, SCH. We have CH as a digraph. These are digraphs, right? They're two characters that go together. You have one for the tone, one for the bass. And uh, so it impacts the way you can input your, your uh, words. Um, so let's talk about um, hard to use. A lot of the literature out there says that orthography reform is needed because the language is hard to use. What do they mean, hard to use? You can type it, can't you? <laughs> well, it, just because you can doesn't mean you want to. Because maybe you have more economical choices. And so at what point is an economical choice presenting too, something that's too much easier so that I don't use the language of identity, but I use this other language instead. It impacts my language choice now. Um, so uh, the literature in the English language for uh, keyboard optimization often centers around this idea of Dvorak versus QWERTY. Most of you probably write with a QWERTY keyboard. And so when you heat map uh, some text, this is the same text, heat map to the keyboards, then this is showing you where your fingers are touching the keys. And this one, the keys have been rearranged so that the more frequently used keys are where you're anatomically centered on the keyboard. So we call that the haptic pattern, the touch pattern, right? And so um, uh, <clears throat> this is a person reviewing, trying to learn Dvorak, right? So this is show the, the emotion that's involved when you have to learn how to type a new way once you're used to it another way. And so if we have this in English language typing, um, my question is, how much more difficult it, or expressible is this sentiment when we talk about the ability to type in minority languages or under resourced languages? And the technical word jargon for computer guys is under resourced languages rather than minority or uh, so uh, endangered languages or such. So um, this is how it happens in English. Let's take a look. This is the uh, Metpa is a language spoken in Mexico uh, that I work with. And you can see where the hot key is for every word is going to have one or two of those that key press. So uh, and then the two and the three are mapped to tone marks. So you're doing a pinky and a finger and a, and a middle finger when you're typing. And this is this is uh, this is a hard to use keyboard because of the haptic domain. 
not necessarily because of anything in the way that it's reading. It's all about hard to use in the writing domain. Um, so when we compare MEPOV spoken in Mexico, English, and Spanish, this is a chart that maps the, the, the fingers with keys. Okay? So pink is, is the MEPOV, um, and uh, the yellow is um, uh, Spanish, and the green is English. So the, the frequency of, of those fingers use for the same text in a parallel corpus. So assuming that you're communicating the same information, assuming that if I had a choice between English and Spanish or MEPA and Spanish, where is the workload? Where is the additional workload? And will that impact me as I try to make language use choices? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is that MEPA keyboard again. And language is instrument versus language is object. Yeah, wh which language is the one that is going to get me to the goals, the communicative goals of my community? Um, so, what's the real cost factor when considering typing in multilingual community environments, and to what degree is the technology factor quantifiable? That's the essential, the quintessential question. So now, I've used uh, parallel corporate. And when I look at Eastern Dan in French and English, which I'll show you some results here in a few seconds, um, I selected two keyboards per language. Uh, there's two keyboard layouts for each of these. I decomposed the corpora into a sets of keystroke values. So <clears throat> when you go to type something, maybe some of you already know this, but uh, when you type something, uh, you can do it, uh, you can touch the keys on the keyboard a couple different ways. One key, one character. Or you can touch a key and it does nothing until you touch a second character and then you get a special character, right? Or a non-obvious character. You could do a corded keystroke, which we do in English for capital letters, right? You can do hold the shift down and then you press the second character, uh, second key, and then you get some alternate, right? So it's corded because you hold it down and you press. Whereas the other uh, one, you do two presses and you get something. So decomposing these out of my corpus. And then, uh, so I have some sort of comparable uh, value for uh, each keystroke. Then I apply weight-based rankings to these keystroke strings. Um, basically, we want to know what, what characters are going to be hit uh, next to each other. Um, you know, what are the, the consistency questions? You compare models without accounting for language. It, nobody's done that, as far as I can tell in the literature, is looking across languages and looking at models across languages. So I use Dvorak, QWERTY, WERSI, which is the French one, Beppo is a, uh, a French optimized one, AFU, uh, and Transmonday, so Eastern Dan's a Monday language. And this keyboard was uh, developed by CNRS. Uh, both were, this one's like a uh, French plus IPA, and this one's uh, stuff specifically for Monday languages. Um, so I have three corpora, and then I have a newspaper collection in Eastern Dan. And um, so I ran my, my, this kind of describes the corpora's a little bit. That, so orthographic words, um, you can see that English, uh, uh, that French has the lowest quantity of orthographic words in the, the James corpus. Um, and so this one is the newspaper corpus, right? And these are um, Bible corpora. So I kind of want to do some optimization work on this one because uh, larger numbers are better in these kind of things. Uh, and so, um, but to give me comparability, I used uh, the translated texts. And uh, you can see that in this newspaper uh, text that we had a lot more characters, uh, the unique characters in, and that are probably uh, using some French characters that are not exp expressly in the orthography because they would have loan words and things like this. Um, so in keyboard optimization questions, you usually solve for a frame, a, uh, a, a layout is the solution. Um, but I found out through this, working with optimization problems, that actually there's a step before that, that before you get to the optimiz optimization, you could say, well, what's the fitness of that? And you can evaluate based on fitness. So I evaluated based on fitness and just left the problem there. 
because if you go to try to find an exact solution, it's going to be tailored to a specific language. So we can compare fitnesses across languages where we, uh, uh, and that makes the algorithm for defining fitness extremely important. So in Eastern Dan, you can see these quantified amounts are a lot higher than they are for their relative French ones. And so the same keyboard uh, on French and Eastern Dan uh, has quite a significant difference. So, it, so definition, can you please define what you mean by fitness? Yeah, so fitness is a computational um, uh, sum of your weighted keystrokes. So you have your characters that you're going to put onto your keystrokes, and then I'm going to give a penalty to each finger, so some fingers are stronger than others, and I'm going to give a penalty to when I have to take the same finger from the top row to the bottom row, or if I have to move my hand in a far, a far way. Yeah? So is this independent of text length? Independent of text. Text length, because you have much larger. Yes. Indep indep um, so that's where the parallel corpus comes in, right? Because the parallel corpus is going to say, regardless of how many words you have, I'm communicating the same message. Yeah, these are all parallel corporate. Yep. Um, it's all James up there, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, um, uh, so for the Eastern Dan writer, it takes about 5.3 times the typing effort when compared with the effort required to type the national language. So we take this language as instrument, then all of a sudden text input ought to be a very important part of our strategy for language development. Um, so, multilingual environments follow, uh, allow for, yes? Sorry, so it, this 5.3, is that the fitness value? Is yeah. But is it taking into account the structure of the language in and of itself? Because you might be com communicating the same idea, but you may be using very different morphology that requires more keystrokes or whatever it might be. 